The introduction of several power cards into the OCG threatened the integrity of the game. This is by no means an exaggeration, as two separate FTK decks entered the fray. And you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Although Exodia and Exchange of Spirit could present an FTK, a third FTK strategy surfaced this year. But before I get to that, I want to talk about the final list of the previous video. We see the limitation of both Breaker the Magical Warrior and Tribe Infecting Virus. Two generic GOAT staples, offering a perfect mix of tempo and card advantage. The other repeats from the list were the limitation of Sangan to be in line with Witch of the Black Forest, as the two tutors were just too strong to be at multiples, offering too much consistency. Sinister Serpent goes to one, as card advantage is strong, and repeatable discard fodder every turn became especially powerful when used with tribe infecting virus. Graceful Charity is the best card selection filter in the game, while card destruction can dig deeper, the neutral card advantage impact of Graceful Charity alongside the ability to choose which cards are discarded separates the two cards. Mirage of Nightmare probably seemed like a good idea in the design room, as it is very slow in accessing new cards and forces the majority of those cards to be discarded. But destroying your own spell card can net you up to a plus two and digging four cards deeper into the deck. Creature Swap, however, was a great idea in the design room. Creature Swap is a neg one in card advantage, but it allows for you to catch up to your opponent, especially if they have a single strong monster on the field. You got the dud! And now for the big one. Butterfly Dagger Elma. This card is on the list because Guardian Elma was too powerful to see the light of day. The Guardian monsters were a series of monsters with an appropriate equip card. But no, seriously. Butterfly Dagger Elma will probably always stay banned because of a loop with Gearfrid the Iron Knight. Which, otherwise, had a pretty useless effect. When you equip the dagger, Gearfrid destroys the dagger, then the dagger returns to your hand due to its effect. You can then activate it over and over and over again. This would not be a problem, except for cards which care about spell card activations. Royal Magical Library gains a spell counter each time a spell is activated, and after it accumulates three spell counters, you can remove them to draw a card. The drawing effect is not once per turn. So with the loop, you could draw every card in your deck, combine it with Exodia, and you have a dangerous FDK deck in the format. So it was very quickly addressed with the limitation. Not to be outdone, the April list was also a dramatic shakeup, but in the opposite direction. Six cards were unlimited, and with only two new limitations. Reflect Bounder is a magic cylinder on a monster, and since magic cylinder is limited, Logically, Reflect Bounder should also be limited. Vampire Lord is one of the vampire cards which force your opponent to send cards from the deck upon inflicting battle damage, which could be extremely weak disruption. But more importantly, the Vampire Lord had a valuable resurrection effect. Monster removal was almost entirely destruction based, so the vampire would be coming back a lot. Only one card went from limited to semi-limited, and it is a big one. Makura the Destructor at 2 facilitates the exchange of spirit FTK and is generally unhealthy for the format. In my opinion, this is a mistake in releasing restraint. Guardian Sphinx and Slate Warrior were just good generic monsters, but they pale in comparison to the faster tribe infecting virus and the more versatile Breaker the Magical Warrior. This is not a case of pure power creep, but it might explain why the cards were unlimited. Limiter removal and rear yoko are fairly efficient attack buff cards, used to facilitate an OTK or sometimes just to beat over a large monster. Finally, backup soldier was unlimited. Weak normal monsters, outside of Exodia, were being phased out of the metagame. Although, this did help Exodia with Makura the Destructor going to 2. July had a single addition to the list, and oh boy, it was a big one. 
Chaos Emperor Dragon Envoy of the End. Just the name is intimidating, but this card is the final piece and the most degenerate strategy in the game so far. You need Chaos Emperor Dragon in your hand, the ability to summon it with a light and dark monster in the graveyard, Sangan or Witch of the Black Forest on the field, still having your normal summon available, and finally having Yadagarasu remaining in the deck. You summon Chaos Emperor Dragon, Activate effect, Sangan or Witch gets destroyed, searching Yadagarasu. If the burn damage from Chaos Emperor Dragon didn't end the game, you summon Yada, attack, and since your opponent has no cards and will not draw one next turn, there is no counterplay. You just chip away with Yada until their life points run out. Absolutely terrible for the health of the game, and I am so glad it got limited. After Chaos Emperor Dragon, the other boss monsters of Invasion of Chaos were added to the list. Blackluster Soldier, Envoy of the Beginning, and Dark Magician of Chaos. BLS is not as flashy as Chaos Emperor Dragon, but still boasted two powerful effects. An option to perform a second attack after destroying a monster by battle, quite strong considering the 3000 attack point monster, or if you wanted to forego battle, you could instead banish a monster on the field. Two very good utility effects, and when you are winning, Chaos Emperor Dragon was often worse than BLS. Demok was pretty good, with the ability to banish any monster destroyed by battle, essentially eliminating floater effects. However, Demok had another effect, the ability to recur a spell card upon summoning, and this is the part which led to loops, and eventually caused the card to get an erratum. Magical Scientist is incredibly powerful, as it could be used to quickly swarm the field, even without fancy synchro or XYZ monsters, the card was degenerate, as you could FTK with Magical Scientist and Catapult Turtle, along with a fusion deck of appropriate targets. Truly unsettling. Manticore of Darkness is another loopy card, which seems to be a theme this year. With two, you could continuously summon and destroy the Manticores, and with Card of Safe Return, for example, you could draw out your entire deck. There were many other payoffs for the summoning loop, but an Exodia FTK seems most tantalizing. Outside of that though, the card was just very strong, coming back like the Vampire Lord which we mentioned earlier, and having superior attack power. Finally, there was one last liberal adjustment on the list, with Morphing Jar going to 2. Morphing Jar is slow, and more importantly, symmetric hand filling. Oftentimes, Card of Destruction is better, as Morphing Jar always gives your opponent 5 cards. Well, that was certainly a year. Quite a lot of strong cards were introduced to the game, and, more terrifying, a number of FTK strategies could be constructed, while existing FTK strategies improved. It is a little scary to see so many cards just being limited, with a single copy allowed to reduce consistency, but not kill the strategy. But all that changes next time, we finally see our first bans, cards actually being forbidden.